morning and welcome to St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Oxford, North Carolina. I'm the Reverend Dr. Vincent Joseph Kopp, Rector at St. Stephen's. During the video portions of this service, when individuals are masked, they are at least six feet apart from anyone else who is in the sanctuary. And during those portions of the service where people are unmasked, they are either alone or in the presence of someone with whom they live on a regular basis. Again, welcome to St. Stephen's in Oxford. service today for the fifth Sunday after Epiphany begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. 
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. Have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is a reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in? Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, might, and power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here ends the reading. The psalm appointed for today is a portion of Psalm 147. Hallelujah! How good it is to sing praises to our God! How pleasant it is to honor Him with praise! The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those who await his gracious favor. Alleluia. The second lesson is a reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, 
so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may, sh may share in its blessings. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue at Capernaum and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I suppose it is one of the inconveniences of being a Christian that we have to come to terms with sin in our lives. The Catechism on page 848 of the Book of Common Prayer, in answer to the question, what is sin, states, sin is the seeking of our own will instead of the will of God, thus distorting our relationship with God, with others, and with all creation. This definition of sin contains within it an interpretation of Jesus' answer to the question put to him in Mark 12. Quote, Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these." Unquote. So, what was the question asked? Which commandment is first of all? Implicit in this passage, where one of the scribes tries to catch Jesus in a trap of over or undervaluing one part of the law, is the notion that sin equals failure to adhere to any part of the law. By law, of course, is meant the law of Moses, which Jews believe contains the will of God. Starting with the Ten Commandments, the law includes numerous corollaries cataloged in Torah, mostly in Leviticus. In all, there are 613 specific rules or mishap in Torah. And though this number, like everything else, gets debated, and so the whole law of Moses is no simple thing to follow. Indeed, experts, the scribes, had to keep track of the laws. Some were positive or do this laws. Others were negative or don't do that laws. Some pertained only to temple sacrifice practices, while others governed everyday life, such as food preparation laws. How to operationalize adherence to the law, a goal that continues today for strict observance Jews, was a major preoccupation in Jesus' time, as few dared court sin by being out of right relationship with God, by skirting any part of the law of Moses. Now, the relevance of this preamble about sin in first century Israel has a specific connection to today's gospel. You may recall from last week that Jesus taught in the Capernaum synagogue and expelled an unclean spirit from an angry disputant in a way that left those present agog. What is this, they asked? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This passage immediately precedes today's gospel, which actually has three parts to it. The first part concerns the healing of Simon's mother-in-law and the crowds drawn to Jesus. The second documents Jesus' practice of retreating to pray alone in God's presence, something we touched on a couple weeks ago. And the third part heralds how Jesus expands the scope of his ministry into the surrounding Galilee communities. Presumably, Jesus does all these things because he is without sin, which is to say, he has discerned and conformed his will to God's will for him. From a first century perspective, the healing part is particularly important for two reasons. First, because sin, a break in a person's relationship with God, was regarded as the reason for all afflictions, disease, madness, alienation, crime, poverty, anything negative. Second, because Jesus the healer reveals his absolute oneness with God, his equal participation in the divine nature of the Father and the Holy Spirit by healing and casting out demons. What is significant about today's gospel is that Jesus uses the authority he revealed in the Capernaum synagogue to its full extent his doing so shows that the kingdom of God is not just near, but open.
to everyone, even the outcasts, unclean and sick persons the religious establishment regard as irredeemable. As the healer, Jesus is the bearer of good news. This good news, that all sins can and will be forgiven by God's power, mercy, and love for those who ask. As the Tiffany tide draws to a close, and Lent begins in 10 days, it is appropriate for today's collect to remind us that sin is the reason we celebrated Christmas in the first place. In Epiphany Tide, we get nudged gently by grace past our Christmas joy toward the Lenten realization. Namely, that trust in the Incarnation gives entry to God's kingdom, not temple sacrifices or the punishment of people who actually deserve justice and mercy, not scorn. That a lack of trust in God translates first into an overvalued trust in ourselves, marks the exit point out of God's kingdom. Isaiah reminds us this, of this when he says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Not us. Apart from God is found only sin's unbroken landscape of broken relationships. That is what Adam and Eve earned outside Eden. That is what most of the Bible's stories tell us. And that is what the prophet Ezekiel's Valley of the Dry Bones represents. A loss of connection to God is the start of sin. And the wages of sin, as Paul said, is death. That we enter Lent with hope of being healed when we turn back toward God and deny ourselves two more ways to say repent is what the colic wants us to remember. That the way to liberty is through the kingdom brought near by Christ Jesus is made evident in the Gospels and reinforced by the epistles. Only Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Son of Man, the Incarnation, the Messiah, lived to fulfill the law of Moses, not in all its minutia, but in its full and original intent. So only Jesus can lead us out of the ways of sin. So, what is sin, you might still be wondering. Is it certain acts alone or certain acts done in a certain way? Christian theologians have spent two millennia debating what constitutes sin in a particular sense, and sometimes even cataloging sins as mortal or venial. In this, they act like the scribes who counted 613 mitzvahs in Torah, only to have to recalculate the number again after the fall of the Second Temple, and then again with the advent of engines and electricity when automated modern life began. Yet, knowing what makes a particular action a sin requires first recognition that our actions and intentions either align with God's will for us or they don't. And second, that our own wills can and do run contrary to God's and thus distort our interpretation of our actions and intentions, usually in our own favor. So let me end with this definition of sin to supplement the one in the Catechism. Sin is committed when we love things and use people. 
Think about it for a minute. The love of things can lead to idolatry, a violation of the first great commandment. The use of people denies them their dignity, a violation of the second great commandment. When we love things above people, doctrines over practices, or espouse our way or the highway, we are being tempted to sin. And it is because sin can be so attractive, so pleasurable, so accessible, so pernicious, that we pray as we do. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For Michael, our presiding bishop. For Sam, our bishop. For Ann, our bishop suffragan. For Vince, our rector. For our diocesan family especially St. Cyprian's, and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. We pray especially for our president, our governor, and our mayor. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, those in prison and their families, and the victims of war and terrorism. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those in our parish family who are ill especially for Mary, Pam, Kelly, Dick, Sissy, Sherry, Leslie, Gail, Herbert, and all those who are on our prayer list, praying for them either silently in our hearts or aloud. Pray that they may receive God's healing grace. I ask your prayers for the men and women who serve in our country's armed forces. Pray that God will guide their action and protect them from harm. Praise God for those in every generation whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord, hear the prayers of thy people and what we have asked faithfully. Grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life, amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.